Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this morning. I pray that you enjoyed that worship. Uh, love that last part, just, just that intimacy with God. Um, I think that always prepares our hearts to really receive uh, the word that he's got for us today and, and every day. I, I just love that intimate worship. Uh, I want to thank you for joining today because you could have been anywhere else, but you chose, chose to join us today. Uh, today, we're going to be teaching on the tithe. Now, many of you have heard teaching on the tithe, and you've heard pastors tell you, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. And, and in many cases, um, you probably felt like your arm was being twisted. You probably felt like, you know, you've, you've done something wrong or you failed to do something. You've probably felt uh, a little like, um, you know, they, they weren't interested in you, but they just wanted money from you. And uh, many pastors, of course, as we talked about before, they've misused this teaching. Um, you know, they, they've, they've, they've tried to, to get people to give and, and try to get people to give uh, larger and bigger and all that good stuff. We don't want to do that today. When we teach on the tithe, I want you to understand, first of all, you know, what it is, what are the origins, what is its purpose, and what is the modern application today for us? Do we see tithe in the New Testament? You may have heard people teach that you know, well, well, there's no tithe in the New Testament. Well, I'm going to show you that that's not true. Now, Jesus doesn't make a very huge um, big deal out of it because it was already established in the culture. It's not that it wasn't a big deal, but in their culture, it was already established. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear him discipline um, the Pharisees and the scribes because they were doing it, but they thought they were uh, better than others because they were and others weren't. And so they weren't focused on the the more important things that were written in the law, like mercy and grace. And so we're going to look at that, too. But because it was established in the culture, no, he didn't spend a lot of time on it because Moses had already spent a lot of time. And because the Jewish people lived under the law of Moses, it, that was already established. It was it was nothing that was in question. And so today, as we move into the tithe, first of all, I want to let you know the tithe itself, it represents something. As a matter of fact, all monetary things, they represent something. And so we're going to look at that. And we're going to look at just a, a, for a brief moment. Standards of, of monetary values that, that we in the United States have used, what we call standards, standards of value, but we're really what they represent. And so I'm going to go ahead and begin to to share the slide with you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll go into this teaching a little deeper. So what is the tithe? And, and first of all, I want to know, I want you to know what the tithe represents. So first of all, the tithe represents work, right? Any monetary value we have, it represents work. We have a, a symbol or something of exchange that we we as assign value to to express the work that we've done. And so in, from 1792 to 1834, we had a silver standard, what they call a bimetal standard. It was actually a mix of silver and gold. And in the United States, that what, that's what we used. Here in the United States, and from 1879 to 1933, we had what we call a gold standard. And so when you were passing a dollar, what you were doing is you're saying this dollar represent, represents a certain amount of gold, just like in the other with the silver standard. It represent, represented a certain amount of this particular gold, which is paid according to the work that's been done. And then since 1971, our dollar is not backed by any standard commodity. We have nothing. Uh, essentially, our our uh, government prints money, and there's really nothing that, that it's valued with. But in this time, when we get to look at the tithe here in the Old Testament, the first thing you're going to see is it represents something else. It represented various things. And so you're going to see them begin to tithe off fruit. They're going to tithe off animals. They're going to even of the firstborn of souls. Uh, they tithed off everything. But their system was more of a system of barter. Now, they had money. They had coinage. They really did. They had it. But it was used more as a matter of convenience rather than what we do today in our economy. 
where the money is what it is. You know, it's that dollar is just that paper dollar where in their time it was based on the thing. So if you were a fisherman, for instance, you got paid for a certain amount of fish, right? It may be the, maybe it was by weight. Or if you were a shepherd, and of course you had various things you can do with with the uh, sheep. Obviously there's food, but there's also wool. And so there are things that they were able to barter with the things that they, it, with their work. And of course, if you were a farmer, your food uh, was bought and that also was a representative of your work. And so the tithe itself represent a percent of your work. So now I want to look at what is the tithe itself? Well, the tithe, according to its initiation into the law, okay? And I need to speak into reference to the Jewish law. And the reason I need to do that is you need to understand that there was tithe before the law, and we're going to look at that too. We're going to actually look at the origin. But the first thing I want to do here is I want to let you understand that when we talk about the tithe, the tithe was always the first portion. So when they brought their fruits and vegetables, when they brought their animals, or when they brought the wool, or when they brought, um, again, the souls, the firstborn, what you're going to see is the tithe was the first portion. It wasn't what they had left over. It was always the first. It was the first portion, the best portion. And so in Exodus 23, 19, and you're going to in Exodus 34, 26, also the children were commanded. The children of Israel were commanded to bring the first of the first fruits of your land. Right. You shall bring into the, the, the house of the Lord, your God. So that was a command. It, and it, it wasn't optional. It was a command from it, it was part of what God uh, begin to direct them to do. And one of the reasons God directed them to do this as we're going to see is he's beginning to allow them to begin to trust him. And so when we talk about finances with most of us, it, it's a matter of survival, right? It's not a matter of being greedy for most of us. It's a matter of survival. We need food, right? We need a home. We need clothing. We need water to drink. We need those essentials. What God was teaching them is he is the one that provides those things. And so he says, what I want you to do is per, bring your first fruits of the land here first. He tells them in Proverbs 3, 9, which, you know, Proverbs is the wisdom books. He says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So not only do you have a command, but you have a promise with the command. You have a command to bring them, but he said, so your barns. So you're bringing all the first fruits to the Lord. He says, but your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, this is one of those scriptures, again, that unfortunately some pastors have, have tried to misuse. And you might have heard of, of a phrase called the prosperity gospel where, hey, you know, so into this and God will do this. Well, God makes us promises, but he never promises that we're going to be overly wealthy. Right. He never told us that he's going to give us a million dollars, but he does promise to provide for us when we make him first. Along with this, in Deuteronomy, remember the second reading of the law. This was to the children. So this first portion was the exodus of the, the first group of people that came out of bondage from Egypt. But the children. Later on in Deuteronomy, we'll have a similar command. So here in Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 3, he says, And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it. Remember, during BTA, we've been studying the inheritance, if you will, through Joshua, the inheritance of the children of Israel. So he's saying when he finally takes them into that, he says that you'll take some of the first of the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. So he's talking about the tent of meeting or the tabernacle, which at that point uh, will initially be in Shiloh. He says, and you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God, I have come to the country which the Lord your God swore to your father. So what he's saying is, is God is fulfilled this promise and so now i'm going to do what the lord said to do later on we're going to look at this but we're going to go a little further because when the children brought their tithe 
they were to make a confession. And that's not taught a lot, but the children of Israel were, were to make a confession when they brought the tithe. So the next question is, um, you may have been taught that, well, the, you know, um, the children of Israel only tithe on, on fruits and vegetables. They only tithe, you know, on, on the profit of the land. Well, I'm going to tell you that's not true. And I'm going to show you later on, after the children of Israel had uh, been in the land for 400 some years, they disobeyed God. They'd been carried away captive to Babylon. God brings them back. And when they come back, one of the first things that's reestablished is the tithe because they need to rebuild uh, the temple. And so God, through Nehemiah, reestablishes the tithe. And, and here he's going to give you a list of things that they were tithing on. And it may surprise you because many people, there, there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of people. First of all, they'll tell you that the tithe's not valid anymore. They're going to tell you that, well, it was only fruits and vegetables and that sort of stuff. You know, they're going to give you all of these reasons why they shouldn't pay tithe. However, they're not biblical in nature. And we're going to show you here what the things were that they actually tithed on. So here in Nehemiah 10, please turn here with me, if you will. Turn in your Bible to Nehemiah 10, 35 through 38. I'll give you a second to get there. And so, as I mentioned, what we, what's happened is the children of Israel have come back. They're building the temple. They're rebuilding the temple. They're putting it back in order, and the, and uh, the, they're coming back. And Nehemiah is really reestablishing the, the the portions of that law, right? He's reestablishing the law so the people begin to get back into the the. I want to say the the law, the rituals of the law, all the things that they were called to do before they were carried away captive, all of the things that they forsook when they started seeking other gods. And so now he's reestablishing those things. And he says, and we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all of our trees year by year to the house of the Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons. Did you catch that? The firstborn of our sons. And we're going to look at this a little deeper. And of our cattle. And as it is written in the law, the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks to the house of God and to the priests who minister into the house of our God to bring the first fruits of our dough, of our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine, the new oil to the priest, to the storerooms of the house of our God and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities and the priest, the descendant of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the, the Levites receive the tithes and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the storehouse of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. So now there's a storehouse and we're going to look at that room, the storehouse later on when we look at Malachi, because God's going to talk about filling his storehouses. And so we're going to come back to this because when we start talking about what is the tithe for, we're going to mention that because it's going to give you uh, a reason if you will, the why behind the what? Why are we bringing this? Why are we doing this? Well, and, and of course, even in that proverb, it says honor the Lord. It's a part of honoring the Lord, but why? Well, we know that the Lord brought them into their inheritance. The Lord was faithful in bringing them into that inheritance to a land flowing with milk and honey. And in response to that, just like in our response to God in our salvation, as he saved us and brought us out of a different life, we offer to him the sacrifices of praises so also when he brings us into that good land, he promises us, we turn around and honor him with the possessions because he gave us those things. But we're going to look more uh, at that purpose later on. But the, one of the other things we're going to do is gonna, we're going to go look at the first mention of tithe. And you might not know this, but the first mention of tithe has nothing to do with the law. The tithe began to happen just as your faith began because of a man named Abraham that began to follow God. And God's built a nation out of Abraham's loins. One of the reasons is because of what Abraham did. Abraham followed God completely and totally. Not only did he believe him for the promise to give him the land, he believed him for a promise of a son and was even willing to sacrifice that son when God told him to. Of course, God stopped that, but he was willing to do that because he believed God didn't give him that son. 
to destroy him. He even believed when we look at the book of Hebrews that God, that Abraham believed that God was even able to raise him up. But because Abraham didn't even withhold his son. But the other thing you see from Abraham is his generosity and the fact that he was grateful to God. And so we're going to look at the scripture, but I need to give you the background. So when we first come to the scripture, what we're going to find here in Genesis 14, 18 through 20 is Lot's nephew was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were several kings in that area who were actually kind of the, the superior kings. There were multiple kings. And so five kings went to war against four kings. But those, those four kings were actually those kings who kind of had most of the authority. The five kings rebelled against them. And the cities that were involved in that were Sodom and Gomorrah before they were destroyed. And Lot lived there, which was Abraham's nephew. They were all taken captive, their wives, their children, and everything in those cities were taken captive by these other kings. And so Abraham arms himself with over 300 trained servants. He's trained these servants for war. He's trained these servants to be a security, if you will. And he goes to war with his 300 servants along with a couple other of his friends in that area. They go to war and they win. And so they bring back Lot, they bring back his family, and they bring back all of the treasures, not just from their, the folks from the kings that had been beaten, but all the rest of them from the other kings too. And they bring back all of this treasure and spoil and people. And so what Abraham does is he comes back to his home, and he meets this king of Salem. His name is Melchizedek. And we're told in Hebrews that he had... He's, he's kind of what we call a Christophany. He's like Christ before Christ was sent into the world. He had no mother, no father, no beginning, no end. And of course, the name Salem, king of peace. It says that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And he was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, now he's blessing Abraham, right? This is Melchizedek blessing Abraham. So, again, this is the response. God blesses him. God blesses Abraham. And Abraham has a response. And so he says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham's response was he gave him a tithe of all. So Abraham refused to take anything before he offered to God. He refused to line his own pockets. As a matter of fact, later on, you're going to see that he refuses to take any of it. But before he did anything, before he returned anything to anybody, he gave the tithe to God because God had blessed him. And so his response to the blessing was to give. So you see, this is a response to something that he believed God did for him. And so, again, as the children of Israel were coming to the promised land and God gave them and blessed them with the inheritance, they also blessed God with the return of the tithe. So here he is. He gave a tithe of all. And, and this wasn't the first thing. Say, this, this is the first mention, right? This is the first mention of tithe. This is about 500 years, maybe a little more, before the law. And then later on, his grandson, Jacob. Jacob had, of course, stolen his brother's birthright. And then later on, he'll steal his blessing. And so his mother sends him away so his brother Esau doesn't kill him. And so he goes and serves Laban. He serves him for like 21 years. While he's there, he gets married. He ends up with two wives, two concubines, and 12 children. Well, at that point in time, I guess when he came back, he didn't have 12 yet. He had 10 children. And so he's coming back. And he knows he's fleeing from Laban, his father-in-law. He's fleeing from him. And he knows the land he's coming into, his brother is there. And he knows he's stolen from his brother. And the last time he saw his brother, his brother wanted to kill him. He was plotting to kill him, which is why his mother sent him away. So now he's coming back into the land. And as he's coming back, he has an encounter with God. 
And so here in Genesis, turn here with me, if you will, 28, 20 through 22. He's coming back into the land. And Jacob has an encounter with God. And then he begins to, to make a vow to God. And Jacob said with his vow, saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way, which I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's because he's fled his father's house. So I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. And so Jason, Jacob also, just like his grandfather, turns around and offers the tenth to God. Of everything that God gives him, he's going to offer the tenth to God out of gratefulness for the blessing that God has put on his life. And look what he asked for. He didn't ask for wealth. He just said, hey, give me food to eat and clothing to put on. And to come back to my father's house in peace because he's fleeing his brother. He's fleeing Esau because he stole everything. So he's on his way to his father-in-law, which he, he doesn't know his father-in-law at the time, but he's on his way there. But he has this encounter. He knows that God is there. He has this dream. And you probably heard of Jacob's ladder. He sees angels coming up and down on this ladder. He has this dream. He realizes that God is in the place. So he sets up that pillar. And he makes this vow. And then he'll serve 21 years in Laban. He'll come back with multiple uh, sons and daughters. He'll, he's going to come back with, with flocks, sheep, and herds. He's going to have camels, sheep, goats, donkeys. He's going to have clothes and money, and, and God has, will just bless him underneath Laban. And so God does that, but again, he offers the tenth because he knows that it's God that did that for him. As a matter of fact, even Laban will, will recognize that God has done that for him. And so Jacob offers that tenth. This here's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 470 years before the law, before God instituted the law that we looked at before. So now we're going to look at the law of the tithe. We're going to look at that law. What does it look like and, and how was it? applied to the children of Israel. What does that mean for us today? So here in Genesis 27, please turn here with me. Genesis 27, 30 through 33. And of course, this is Moses commanding the children. It says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. So if you borrow some of the tithe when you pay it back you're to add one fifth to it so god doesn't necessarily mind you borrowing the tithe as long as you pay it back and you add one fifth to it kind of like an interest if you will he says and concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock of whatever passes under the rod the tenth one shall be holy to the lord he shall not inquire whether it is good or bad nor shall he exchange it if he exchanges it at all then both it and the exchange for it shall be holy, and it shall not be redeemed. In other words, you can't borrow of that piece of it. You can borrow of, the, of the, the fruit of the land, but you can't borrow against it, and you can't buy it back. Being redeemed means, to, to redeem means you buy it back. He can't buy back the, that tenth one. Every tenth one belongs to them, and they were to do that as their, their sheep were born. They were born in multitudes, so they would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, that tenth one, is the Lord's. And they did that first before they took their own, before they they sheared them, before they, they offered them, before they sold them. That tenth one belonged to God. They did that first. And it couldn't be bought back. It belonged to God. Uh, later on, you're going to find that if it was an unclean animal like a donkey, they would be able to buy that back. But if they didn't want it back, if they didn't want it back, they had to do something awful. They had to break its neck. Because it still belonged to God. And if God couldn't use it and they weren't going to redeem it, they broke its neck. And this wasn't the only thing. In Exodus 13, 1, God gives a command to Moses for the children of Israel. And he tells them this. He says, then the Lord spoke to Moses. This is Exodus 13, 1. Spoke to Moses saying, consecrate to me. All the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, is mine. 
So now there's the tithe of the firstborn. The firstborn son belongs to God. If there's a firstborn of an animal, it belongs to God. And so they've been given this direction that the firstborn belongs to God. And so, again, many of that played out. Many of those were, were given for work. Many of those were not as slaves, but, but for work. They would work for the Levites and they would get, get a wage and so forth, but they would work for the Levites. In Deuteronomy 14, 23 to 26, again, that first portion of Exodus is to the first generation that came out of Egypt. Then there's another direction right there's a because of those children died in the wilderness their children in deuteronomy get a similar command deuteronomy 14 23 through 26 and we looked at this earlier and you shall truly tithe of all the increase of your grain uh, that the field produces year by year and you shall eat before the lord your god in a place where he chooses to make his name the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the firstborn of your herds and of your flocks that you may learn to fear the lord your god always this is where money comes in. He says, but if the journey is too long for you so that you're not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far for you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or similar drink. For whatever your heart desires, you shall eat it there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. And so they were given a command if it was too far, if they couldn't make it there, or maybe the, the, the tithe wouldn't make it there. Maybe the sheep or goats or donkeys, they wouldn't make the trip. So they could exchange it for money, and when they got there, they could buy those things there for that very purpose. The high priest later on will abuse this. And they'll begin to raise sheep and stuff around the temple. And they'll make a, a um, warehouse, if you will, of every type of sheep. But they don't look to see if the sheep are, you know, because when you offer to the Lord, it had to be a perfect lamb. It couldn't have any spot or blemish. Well, they just begin to offer anything. And so they created an enterprise there. And that's when you see Jesus coming and cleansing the temple. Because they were selling wares and doing trade there in the temple when it should be a place of prayer. And so they were able to do this, but it was supposed to be limited in nature. But it became abused later on. Deuteronomy 26, 4 through 15 says this. It says the, the priest will take the basket out of your hand. And now, remember I told you the law of the tithe. They were to make a confession, right? So when they came and they brought their tithe to the priest, they stood before them to make this confession. And here's what it was. So the priest shall take the basket out of your hand. This is Deuteronomy 26, 4 through 15. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, my father was a Syrian about to perish. And he went down to Egypt and dwelt there. Few in number, and there became a nation, great and mighty and populous. They're talking about Jacob. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord our God, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place. And has given us this land. This is, remember, that's the promised land, their inheritance. A land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which the Lord, O oh, 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 Lord, oh, Lord, have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you and your house. And you and the Levite. And the stranger who is with you and among you, when you have finished laying aside all of the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of the tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house and have also given them to the Levite, the stranger, 
the fatherless and the widow according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it in the mor in morning, nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people, the people Israel, and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so they make this confession that they haven't taken any of it. They haven't misused any of it, and they've given it. And we're going to come back to that last portion, because in that last portion is going to show us what that tithe was for. So it's very important that we understand that. So what was the tithe for? Numbers 18 through 21. Of course, this is to the first generation. What I just read to you was to the second generation. What was the tithe for? Turn with me to Numbers 18, 21 through 24. It says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting lest they bear the sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So remember, as we've studied in BTA, when they came into the land, all of the tribes except Levi received an inheritance. And so what happens? Well, they serve the tabernacle. Their, their portion, their inheritance is God. And so when people bring the tithes, then they get those tithes. But even they offer tithes. We're going to look at that too. So they also give a tithe, tithe of the tithes. So they bring the first fruits, the best in to the Levites. Why? Because the Levites, it's their livelihood. It's what they live off of. And so they, they bring, so the Levites who are doing the work of the tabernacle, they're doing the work of the house of God. And so they bring in and the tithe is for them to live off of, but they also give a tithe and it's also for something else. And we're going to look at that as well. We're going to come back to what we read in Deuteronomy. But here in Numbers 18, 25 through 28, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you uh, from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were grain of, of the threshing of the floor or as the fullness of the winepress. Thus you shall also offer the heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes, which you receive from the children of Israel, and you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. And of all of your gifts, you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the consecrated part of them. Therefore, you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor, as the produce of the wine press. You may eat it in any place, and you and your households, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall bear no sin because of it when you have lifted up the best of it. But you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. So, even the Levites brought tithes to the Lord from the tithes that came in. And if they, if they devalued that, if they didn't give the Lord the best as they were called to, then the Lord, of course, judged them for that. We're, we're told that uh, uh, two of Aaron's sons offered up profane fire before God. And uh, we don't know whether it's because of the tithe or something of that nature, but they offered up profane fire and the Lord killed them. We see it also with... Uh, Eli's sons. Eli was the, the, the priest and his sons misappropriated the tithe and God killed them too. 
He allowed them to die in war because of their actions. And so here in Deuteronomy, we're returning back to Deuteronomy 14 that we looked at before. And we're going to, to really hone in on the other portion of what the tithe is for. We know part of it is for the priest because they do the, house, the work of the house of the Lord. But there's also another part that they brought in because they didn't take all of it. They didn't eat all of it. So in Deuteronomy 14, 27 through 29, we're going to look at that second part. It says, you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part of inheritance. And at the end of every third year, you should bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you. It says, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of the hand which you do. So it provided for the Levites who do the work of the service. They receive no inheritance, but it also provided for strangers, the fatherless and the widow. Okay, so God was concerned with those who didn't have anything. They obviously the fathers is, is is orphans. They had no way to make money. They had no way. They had nothing coming in. So the Lord made sure that they were taken care of. The widow. Remember, we told you that that women uh, weren't able to to own land or whatever. So if they lost all their sons and their husbands dead, they have no way uh, to be taken care of. So the Lord ensured that they were taken care of. And the stranger, those who were just coming through, maybe they don't have it. Maybe they're poor. But so what had happened is they had these storehouses. And so they would store it up within their gates and they would have these storehouses for the poor, for the widow, for, for the, the orphans and for strangers that would come through. And they were there. They were called to be generous and hospitable to those who come through. They weren't called to be hostile toward people they didn't know. They were called to be generous toward them. And so this allowed the priest to do that. Because they were able to create these storehouses and provide for those among who, who didn't have anything. And, of course, again, it allowed for the priest as well. So they got that the, the first portion. They got the tithe. They took the first of the first portion and they gave that to God. And then they had the rest. And then anything that was left over, they created the storehouses for the poor and the widow and the orphans. And so that is what the tithe is for. And here's the thing. It really hasn't changed. And even in Paul's day, Paul, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 18. I need to show you something. This is extremely important because people say, well, why do, do pastors today? Well, obviously, pastors fill that place of, of the priest. They do the work of God. And even Paul gave a command. And so he's answering to those in the Corinthian church who um, are, uh, you know, accusing in a certain way. And, and they're really not following his word at this time so he begins to make the statement so first corinthians 9 1 through 18 he says am i not an apostle am i not free have i not seen jesus christ our lord are you not my work in the lord if i am not an apostle to others yet doubtless i am to you for you are the seal of my apostleship in the lord my defense to those who examine me is this because he was being accused do we have no right to eat and drink do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, right? They're talking about James and Judas, and Cephas is Peter. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? You hear what he's saying? Who who, and again, who's doing these things and then doesn't benefit, of course, from those things that come in? He says, who, who plants a vineyard does not eat of it, its fruit? He says, or who tends the flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? He says, do I say these things as a mere man or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. He says, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? He says, for our sakes, no doubt. This is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes, thresh in hope, uh, should be partaker of this hope. And if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? He says, if others are partakers of this right over you, 
Are we not even more? He says, nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. He says, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things at the temple? And we just showed you that that, that was for the priest. They eat of the, the tithes, right? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. He says, even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So let me come back to this is where pastors and evangelists have begun to, to overly rely on things and begin to misuse this. Because, yes, if we preach the gospel, we should live from the gospel. There's nothing wrong with pastors receiving uh, a wage for teaching the gospel. All right. There's nothing wrong with that. However, when they become greedy and they begin to live in luxury, as no one was called to do, right? When none of us were called to live in luxury. We were called to, to be content with the things that God has provided for us and live a simple life, a balanced life. And so it's not about bigger houses, more, you know, uh, newer cars and new clothes. It's not about that at all. We're called to be content with such things as the Lord has provided for us. And so Paul goes on. So he says, look, it's right for those who preach the gospel, right? They, they should live from the gospel. However, he says this, and this is where I'm coming from as your pastor. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so for to me. For it would be better for me to die that anyone should make my boasting void. If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for of necessity it is laid upon me. I never wanted to be a pastor, neither did Paul. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. They may not abuse my authority in the gospel. And so me as a pastor, I've chosen to be a bivocational pastor, although, you know, I could be like a lot of folks, quit their job and, 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 and try to get people to support me. I'm not going to do that because the goal here is for me not to abuse the authority. And my reward is that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. I don't want to be guilty. Right. I as a pastor, I do not want to be guilty of greed. I don't want to be guilty of people thinking that. The church only wants money. I don't want to be guilty of taking the name of Jesus Christ and it being attached to greed somewhere. And so I've chosen to be a bivocational pastor. I will tell you it's infinitely more difficult because there's time that, that I have to balance, right? That, that pastors who do it full time don't have to worry about because they're living from the tithe. I've chosen not to do that. I, I've chosen to kind of follow Paul's model. Paul was a tent maker. And he told the children of Israel that, or, you know, the people that he preached to that, look, I provided for my necessities with the work of my own hands. And I'm doing the same. And I'll continue to do the same. Because God has called me to do this this way. And I know he'll provide regardless. There's nothing I need that I don't have. And so this is where we have to be careful as pastors because we can guilt people and give and say, well, you know, they're supposed to live from this. And yes, they are. He said God is commanded it it wasn't just oh they they should be able to he says god has given the commandment right even so the lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel my heart is to to take everything that may be given into this ministry and put it back into the ministry so we can do more with it so we can serve others with it uh as you know children are starting back to school and one of the things we want to do is get backpacks and stuff fill it with uh, supplies and we want to make sure children who can't afford those can have school supplies. We want to make sure we, we take care of those who have a need. And, and so for us, when you see those things coming in, you know what they're going for. They're going to be ministering to those who have a need. Now, so you, you've seen what, what a lot of pastors, a lot of evangelists have lived off of, what they've, they've used. They've tried to, to use this as trying to justify uh, their actions. One of the other scriptures, and probably the most misused among all the scriptures when we talk about tithe, is this verse I'm getting ready to teach you. 
It's called it's Malachi 3, 8 through 12. And because there's a, there's a hint of truth to what they teach. And so I've labeled this slide. The tithe brings blessing and cursing. That is true. That's in the scripture. And we're going to read that here. But I want to caveat this, that when God is, begins to teach in Malachi, okay, if you go to the, the first chapter of Malachi, what you're going to find is about the eighth verse. God kind of clarifies who he's talking to, and he's talking to the priest. All right. In this case, he's talking to me. He's talking to those who, who are men of God leading the people. Why? Because when the priest sins, the people sin. When the man of God sins, his people sin. And so he's talking to them. Now, this is for everyone. I want you to understand it's for everyone. But when God is addressing them, he's addressing the priest here. Now, he'll go back and after this verse and he'll talk to the people. But it's because the people were following the priest. And so with, with this verse, I need you to understand the context of it so you don't allow other pastors and people to mistreat you and use this to force you into something, to use this into pushing you into something. So here in Malachi 3, 8 through 12, he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. We're not going to cover offerings in this teaching. I'm going to cover that in another time. We're focusing on tithes. He says, in tithes and offerings. He says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. I'm going to stop right there. Some of you may just got an eye full. Maybe you've never seen that before. So you're saying, if I don't tithe, I'm cursed. If you're a child of God, if you are in relationship with Jesus Christ, what you're going to find is that you will do more with the 90% than you will ever do with the 100%. Because God is teaching you now that you have awareness, God will hold you accountable, but not for you to give money to me or anyone else. This is something that you have to settle in your heart. This is something that you yourself have to trust and walk in, in faith with God. Remember, we're told that anything that's not a faith is of sin. And so if you're not ready here, if you're not ready to do this, you need to spend some time in the presence of God because I don't want you giving and being resentful. I don't want you giving and being worried that you can't pay your bills. I don't want you giving and thinking that, you know, well, this, you know, the ministry doesn't even care about me. They, they don't care that I'm struggling. I don't want that. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that you shouldn't give if it's something where you're disgruntled, right? It says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. He don't want you to, to feel your arm being twisted, and he doesn't want you to give begrudgingly. He wants you to do it because it's something that he settled in your heart. And just like everything else in your walk with God, there will be things that God will convict you of at a specific time. He might convict me, say, of the tithe uh, before he, he deals with something else. But he's dealt with something else with you. And so there has to come that place where God has revealed this to you in such a way where it becomes what I call revelation. It's a rhema word where God says, hey, this is your time to begin to do this because I need you to trust me. OK, has nothing to do with church. It has to do with your relationship and your walk with God. And so I don't want anyone leaving here today to say, well, Jamie said I got to do this or there's a curse on my life. I didn't say that. But the scripture tells us that when we're aware, right, he says, and again, he's talking to priests here. But it will follow the people. But when the priests do what's right, the people will do what's right. He says, you're cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So now he didn't just say the priest. He says, even the whole nation. But it started with the priest. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Remember, I told you what the storehouse was. It fed the poor. It fed the widows. It fed that, right? It says that there may be food in my house. And now this is the only place in Scripture, the only place in Scripture where God tells you to test him. In most cases, we're told, do not test the Lord. But this is a place in Scripture where God actually invites you to test him. 
It's the only place. Don't test him. If you've got a terminal disease and you've never believed God for a headache, don't test him in relationships. Don't test him in these other areas. This is the only place God gives you permission to test him. That word try means test. He says, and try me now. In the Old Testament, it may say prove this, right? And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let me stop. He said blessing. Okay. He didn't just say just money. He didn't say he's going to give you so much money. Right. He said blessing. So you talk about financial stability and health. Your physical health, your mental, emotional health. Right. Health across the spectrum. Blessing. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Shalom. That's what he's talking about here. He says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out for such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Remember I told you you could do more with the 90% than you could with the 100%? Because God makes a promise here. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So some of you, you've probably had this situation where it seems like you're getting ahead and everything's going well, and then something happens. Maybe you know, you started to save up a little bit in the account, and then maybe the refrigerator dies, or maybe the car dies, or or maybe something happens, and now you've got to use that money you saved up to do something else. Well, there's a reason for that. It's part of that curse, if you will, if you're a Christian. But it's not like God curses you like your life's just going to, you, you know, you're not going to die. He's not putting sickness on you. But something happens. Well, if you notice that pattern in your life, it might be because of the tithe. Okay, it might be because we've sinned according to uh, in the tithe, right? That we 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 don't want to take of the things of the tithe and use it for other things. It, it belongs to God. So he says, "I'll rebuke the devourer." So he'll stop that cycle, is what he's saying. I'm going to stop the cycle of, "Hey, we're getting ahead," and then all of a sudden something bad happens. I'm going to stop that cycle, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And so what will happen is the Lord will see, the Lord will create around you. Will people actually see the blessing on your life? Not because you're filthy rich, but because as a whole, your life is healthy, right? You're physically healthy. You're mentally, emotionally healthy. You're financially healthy. You know, you're healthy in your work. You're healthy in your environments. There's not a lot of strife around you. Because you've allowed God to minister to you in that tithe. You've trusted him in that area. And he breaks the curse and, and he strips that cycle of, man, I just can't get ahead. Seems like I do well for a while and then all of a sudden, bang. No, the Lord will, will, will stop that cycle. So it's not about him being angry at you, okay? I need you to understand this. It's not about the Lord being angry. It's about trusting him in that area. It's not about church. It's about trusting God. It's you and your relationship with God. And so what I want you to understand, if you will, is that God wants you to trust him in every area. He wants to trust you to trust him with your relationships, with your health. He wants you to trust him with your finances. He wants you to trust him with your time. He wants you to trust him in every aspect at your work and in your home. He wants to be intimate with you and he wants relationship with you. And he wants there to be nothing that you hold back. However, here's one thing in America, because, again, these are these resources that we use for our necessities, right? They provide our home. They provide our, our utilities. They provide our food and our clothing. They provide the things we need, right? And so God says, look, you need to understand that I'm the one who provides those. And your job is not your source. I'm your source. I gave you the job. And so if you'll honor me here. I will ensure that you'll see there will be no lack. You'll lack nothing. Because I'm the same today, right? Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the God who provided for you in the first place, and I'll continue to provide. And he'll do it in such a way that people around you will see, my gosh, how is everything so well in your life? Well, it's because what God is doing. It's because I've trusted him with everything. I've given him everything. Just like Abraham took his son, his one and only son, the one he waited for for 32 years. And he was willing to sacrifice him upon that altar. And just as he was getting ready to do it, the Lord stopped him and said, 
Abraham, Abraham, stop. He says, now I know that you love me. Now I know that you trust me because you weren't even going to withhold your one son. You've been waited all this time. This child of promise, you weren't, you weren't even going to withhold him from me. I know that I can trust you. And so what's Abraham called that place? Yahweh Yahweh, or Jehovah Jireh, if you say it in English. Yahweh Yahweh. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So when you're willing to sacrifice that and set it before God and trust him with it, God will provide because in the mount of the Lord, it's provided. Again, not for us to chase wealth, right? Not for us to, to live in luxury. It's because we trust God with our whole life. We're told that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. So the question is, do we trust God more than we trust the money? Do we trust God more than we trust our job? Do we trust God more than we trust the bank? Do we trust God more than we trust the debt? That's why there's the blessing and the curse. It has nothing to do with the money itself. The money is inanimate. It doesn't mean anything. It's a tool. The question is, do we trust God in that moment? Do we trust God for those things that we, we trust most, that we need most, right? And the necessities, do we trust him there? Do we trust that he will be faithful in that? If you can trust that he'll be faithful, that when you die, you'll be with him in eternity. Can you also trust him with the right here and now and the, and the necessary things? Can you do that? And so that's the issue. So I hope that brings clarity to what the tithe is, what it's for, and how we approach it today. Because it's all about our walk with God, our faith in God, right? It's all about our relationship with him. It's not about a ritual. And I'm going to tell you now, if you still struggle with this, it's okay. Because I'm not here to twist your arm. I'm not here to make you do anything. This has to be something that you, with your walk with God, has to become revelation to you. I had to come to this place. Anyone else who's tithing today has had to come to that place. And believe me, it doesn't come easy. And so if you're not tithing, I'm not rebuking you. If you're not tithing, I'm not judging you, not looking down on you. I understand how difficult it could be. Especially when there's already not enough. I get it. So God's not angry at you. He doesn't hate you. He's not mad at you. But just know as you allow him to have more and more of who you are, you'll get to that place where you can trust him there too. You'll grow into it. And I believe that for you because I know that I, as a man of God, had to grow into that and I'm doing that. And I believe where the priest goes, so do the people. So as I step out forward and I do those things, I believe you also, those of you who are allowing me to teach you, will be doing those same things in your time. Not because I've pressed you into doing it, not because I've guilted you into doing it, not because, you know, I've twisted your arm, but because God himself will reveal it to you in due time. Just like everything else in your walk. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. And so now we're going to look at the tithe in the New Testament. Many will tell you, well, God doesn't mention it. Jesus doesn't mention the tithe. Well, he does. It's just the way he mentions that we miss it because he's trying to let us know that that tithe, the ritual of the tithe, doesn't make you righteous before God. Okay? The tithe, just because you tithe, doesn't make you better than anyone else. Because there's more important things in your walk with God that are, are more important to you. And so here in Matthew 23, 23 and you see this in luke eleven forty two 42 as well he says here in matthew 23 23 woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice mercy and faith he says these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone let me rewind that these, justice, mercy, and faith, he says, these you ought to have done, right? He's focusing their attention because they think they're better than everyone else because they're tithing. He says, without leaving the others undone. 
Why? Remember I told you in their culture, that was already established. It's part of the culture. Tithing was just a part of who they were. It was part of the ritual of walking in the law. That was their, their daily life. It was their yearly life. So it wasn't disputed then. So he didn't spend a lot of time on it. But he did tell them, do not leave it undone. But he wanted them to focus on justice, mercy, and faith. Because those, right, they, they weren't doing. They weren't doing, right? If you read it out of Luke, he says it this. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And so we see a full picture here. He wants you to focus on the love, mercy, and justice of God, right? But he also doesn't want you to leave the tithe undone. There's another place in Hebrews where the scripture begins to tell us about what happened when Abraham paid and and even that the the Levites paid tithe, even though they were paying. Remember, we showed you the law where they had to pay tithe. But he begins to discuss here. Turn to Hebrews 7. And we're going to read verses 1 through 10. For he, tells, he says for this Mechizedek, Hebrews 7, 1 through 10. He says for this Mechizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. And blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part, first being translated king of righteousness and also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. In other words, Mechizedek was higher than Abraham, which in their mindset was beyond fathom. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Mechizedek met him. So we still see us bringing tithes to that high priest. Mechizedek was, again, that, that Christophany before Christ had been sent into the world, born into the world. But you see him blessing Abraham and Abraham in response, giving the tithe. And so also were the Levites who would receive tithes also giving tithes at that point. And of course, I showed you in the law that they themselves paid tithes as well. Same here. I have to pay tithes as well. As a man of God, I have to live what I'm teaching. I have to do what I'm showing you all to do. And so today, I hope this has brought some clarity. I hope it took pressure off of you. I hope you're not feeling pressure. I hope you're not feeling that your arm's being twisted. I hope you're not feeling that, uh, you know, you're being scolded in any way, shape, or form. But I hope that it brought an understanding of the tithe, what it is, what it's for, and what our response is with it, and how we apply it today. And, and so I, I hope it brings something to you where... This is, if you're, again, if you're struggling, it's between you and God. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that God still loves you, regardless of whether you're tithing. All right? I want you to know that God isn't angry with you. So with that, um, I'm going to stop recording. And I'm going to allow you... Uh, to ask questions because again this is a topic it's been a sore topic for a long time people struggle with this it's probably one of the things people struggle in Christ with more than anything because it's such a sensitive matter and um, and it's been misused unfortunately it's it's been abused 
by the church. So with that, let me stop recording and, and I'm going to let you all ask some 